Mark Gavor, and today we're going to talk about regression models, which is the first um, chapter we're going to cover in our unit on forecasting and prediction. So let's begin. Um, I usually skip the learning objectives, but what we'll talk about is uh, we're certainly going to talk about the introduction, the scatter diagram, simple linear regression measuring the fit of the regression model, using computer software for regression using both QM and data analysis in Excel, and assumptions of the regression model, testing for the model for significance, multiple regression, and we'll probably stop with binary or dummy variables. So it's a great tool for people to use. It's uh, understand the relationship between two variables. If we have a variable that we can use one to predict the other and we're, we're happy with the predictability or how good the predictive level is well then we can use the regression model or regression equation to make estimates and predict things and that's the whole point of what we're trying to do uh, usually when we talk simple linear regression we're talking about two variables a predictor variable and a predicted variable when we talk multiple regression models, we have more than one predictor or input variables, and but we always only have one output or predicted variable. So when we talk about it, the, actually the terms we use are dependent variable, or sometimes called response variable, and independent variable, which are sometimes called explanatory or predictor variables. So we will take an independent variable and use it to predict a variable that's called dependent variable, dependent on its independent. In multiple regression, we may have two independent variables and try to predict a dependent variable. We tend to label these variables x, x1, x2, and these we tend to label y. We're trying to predict y using some independent variables. So first thing we would like to do when we're doing simple linear regression is to just plot the data points to see what it looks like. So the independent variable is normally plotted on the x-axis and the dependent variable is normally plotted on the y-axis. So here's this company, Triple A Construction. They renovate old homes, and managers have found that the dollar volume of the renovation is dependent on the area payroll. In other words, if the area payroll goes higher, um, their sales are going to go higher. So they measure the local payroll in millions of dollars, and their sales in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the first thing they do is they take these two variables. And you know, what are we interested in predicting here? We're interested in predicting my own company, Triple A sales. So that makes it the, the, the variable I'd like to predict. And I can't really control the local payroll. That's really an economic, a macroeconomic factor or a microeconomic factor. And so that's the independent variable that I have no control over, but it influences this variable that I'm trying to predict. So if we plot this, and you can already see they kind of eyeballed a line to fit it and say, well, you know, we could use a line to represent this, this model. In the old days, we actually used to use very good graph paper and take this data. This would be x. This would be y. And plot it. And then we would actually eyeball a bet, best fit line use a straight edge and draw the line. It would be at the intercept right here, which is 2. And if we go from 0 to 2, that's a change in x of 2. And y goes to like 4.5. So uh, the slope is going to be slightly over 2, 2 and a quarter, let's say. So it would be 2.25x plus 2 equals y. I'm just using a simple linear equation, y equals mx plus b. So the regression models are used to test if there's a relationship between the variables. There's always some random error, 
as we can see here, not everything lies on the line, no matter how we draw the line, there's always going to be points that are off it. So in this case, we use Greek letters, which means we're looking for the um, population parameters. So beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus a little bit of error equals y. So y is the dependent variable or the response variable. x is the independent variable which is sometimes called the predictor or explanatory variable. B zero, uh, beta 0 is the intercept. A value of y when x is 0, beta 1 is a slope, e is a random error. Now, we can't find the population parameters, but with, in statistics, we use statistics to make estimates of them. So we want to estimate on a smaller sample and here's the data. We don't have all the data of local payroll and sales, but we've collected some data. So based on the sample of data, we want to estimate B0, the slope of this line. I mean, the intercept of this line, I apologize. And the slope of this line, and then try to get an estimate for what Y will be. So what Y hat is the predicted value of Y. B0 estimates beta 0 based on samples on the sample we have, and B1 estimates the slope beta 1 using the same sample of data. So we're trying to predict sales, as we said, y equals sales, x equals payroll. The error is the actual value minus the predicted value, because we're going to use it, we're going to have a line, and so we measure it horizontally. This one is right on a line, it's going to have zero error. And the error is always in terms of y. But this one here has this distance will be the error. Here's the predicted for when payroll is 4. And here's the actual. And we see there's a difference. There's two points for 4. So we have two errors for 4. Probably the error for 4 is going to be the average of those two. There's only one error for 5 and one error for 6. So the way we do this is we use this least squared method. So we define some things. X bar is the average of all the X's. Y bar is the average of all the Y's. B1 is X minus X bar times Y minus Y bar. And the summation sign means you sum that those multiplications up for each observation divided by X minus X bar squared. That gives you B1. B0 is Y bar minus B1 X bar. The best fit line always goes through X bar and always goes through Y bar. We don't have time to prove it. You have to take my word for that. So you could do all these calculations. You could do all of these calculations. Or there's a simpler way of doing it, which I will show you right now. I have to open up my uh, Excel, and I'm going to open up a small Excel plot here. And I want to copy this data. What do we have? Six. So let's call it Y. I like to have the X column first. This book always likes to put the Y column first. So I'm going to do six, eight. Oops, I'm sorry. 6, 8, 9, 5, 4.5, and 9.5. And then corresponding are some x values. And it's 3, 4, 6, 4, 2, 5. And it doesn't really matter if the x values are, um, you know, the units, because remember this was in millions and this was in hundreds of thousands. It's just a matter of zeros that come out in the final equation. So let's make this bold and let's make it look pretty. Maybe I'll put a little, you know, my normal thing here. I'll probably box it in because it's what I do. And then what do we do? Now here's the easiest trick ever. So we've got our data in here. 
if I want to plot it, I would just go insert. And I've already got it all highlighted. So I say recommended charts and I would do a scatter plot. Isn't that nice? There's my data. And if I go over here to say insert a quick layout, I'm going to go here where it says f of x and it actually gives me a formula. It tells me, let me get rid of this. Let me make the chart a little bit bigger. And let me make this bigger. It actually gives me the equation right there, 1.25x. I said 2.25, I guessed wrong. Plus the intercept was 2. And we have this r squared, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, is equal to 0.69. So if they go through all of this, these calculations, and they come up with the same equation we did, 2 plus 1.25x. So why go through all this when you can just do this? It gives you a simple linear regression very fast. Now, when you do your homework, I expect to see the axes labeled. So you could uh, change this to local payroll. And millions of dollars and you could call this uh, triple A revenue and you can title it whatever you want. Title as you see fit. And then if you want to make the plots different or cooler, you can add colors or whatever you want to do. I'm pretty basic in how I do it. And uh, so there you go. There's how to do a very simple, easy linear regression model. So sales equals 2 times 1.25 times the local payroll. If the payroll next year is 600, that means the company is expecting um, 9.5 or $950,000 in sales. So regression models can be made for any variables x and y. How do we know the model is actually helpful in predicting y based on x? Well, first of all, we can compute any two things together. And usually, you have to have some suspicion, some suspicion that the two things are related. So it always helps to have a subject matter expert, someone that knows what it is you're talking about. So it sounds like a reasonable idea of what you're trying to do. Uh, Walt Disney was once quoted as saying, it's always good to have at least one person on a team that knows what the heck they're doing. I strongly recommend that when you're doing a regression so you don't try to predict silly things. Um, there was an example in the 1950s where they thought polio was um, related to ice cream consumption because po incidence of polio uh, in increased in the summer at almost the same rate as people started eating ice cream in the summer. And they would peak out in the middle of the summer ice cream consumption, and that would go down as the weather cooled as what did polio. So there was a relationship, there was a correlation, if you will, between ice cream and polio, but it was not causal. So you have to be very careful with this stuff. So anyway, let's look at the, the next step here. There's three measures of variability. Total variability about the mean, uh, variability about the regression line, and total variability that is explained by the model. So this is the sum of squares regression, sum of squared error, and uh, sum of squared total. Let's see what those are. So sum of squared total is just this term y minus y bar squared. These are all like variances. We're not dividing by n. If we divided by n, this would be um, the variance of y. Now this one is the sum of squared error. So instead of y bar, we're using the predicted value. y minus the actual y minus the predicted y squared and sum those up. And then we have the sum of squares due to regression. y bar minus the, the actual, or the predicted y minus y bar squared. And if we add these up, we see that three would be equal to each other. Of course, you got to do this, some math here, and this involves a FOIL method. We're not going to get into it. Trust me that it works. 
So you could go through and calculate all this and get these sums of squares. And you see that the sum of squared 6 plus 16.8 plus or 16 6.9 plus 15.6 is like 22.5. So it really does work. So here's the sum of squared total for Triple H construction: 22.5, 6.8, 15 Now, here's how this looks. If we look at this, here's my y bar. Here's the original graph that we had. And here's the, the, the regression line, 2 plus 1.25x. Here's the y bar line. And so for this point right here at 5, we have this point here. So the distance from the mean y bar to the actual is y hat or y caret minus y bar. Then from the regression line to the... A uh, predicted point is the actual y minus y hat. And then this total distance is y minus y bar. Okay? So we come up with this measure. It's really the ratio of uh, the sum of squares regression and the sum of squares total, which is really 1 minus the sum of squared error divided by the sum of squared total. And it comes out to 6.99. And if we look at this, we see our 6.99 R squared. Normally, R is a small letter, but for some reason, Excel uses it as a capital letter. So here's the thing to remember. About 69% of the variability in the, in the revenue for AAA is explained by the equation based on the payroll. So this is the way you interpret it. It's really important. And you want to use this in your text boxes, in your full sentence answers. I would love to see that. About 69 or 69.44% of the variability in AAA revenue is explained by the regression model based on local payroll. Okay? Now... It's called the coefficient of determination, weird name for it. Most people just refer to it as R squared, coefficient of determination. It's not a measure of determination. And I'm not sure where they got it. Some of the math terms like numerator, denominator, coefficient of determination probably used to make sense a lot more when they were first coined than they probably do to people now just learning it. Now, if you take the square root of r squared and just get r, you get the correlation coefficient, which is also called the Pearson co correlation coefficient. And it's always, it's, it, it's really, even though QM calculates it for every kind of regression, it really only works for simple regression. And it's a measure of linearity. It goes from plus one to minus one. If it's plus one, and we'll talk about it in a minute, it's perfectly linear going uphill. If it's minus one, it's perfectly linear going downhill. And if it's zero, it means it's just a scatter diagram. There's no relationship at all. So for AAA construction, if we take the square root of 0 0.6944 and we get 83.33 or 0.8333, that's the Pearson correlation coefficient. When it's r is equal to one, it's a perfect line. You don't even have to, you, it, every point lies on a line. If it's a negative one, every point lies on a line, but it's going downhill. If in between zero and one, the line is going uphill, but the points don't all lie. The closer it gets to zero, the more it gets like this. So here you have a relationship where R is zero and the slope of the line is zero. When you get the slope of the line being zero, it means there's no relationship. So one of the things we want to do is then use data analysis in Excel. It says Excel 2010, but it still works in yours. And you can install that by, if you go to, I forget how to do it. I think I, it's in one of the videos I posted. But if you don't have data, if you go into your data tab. And if I move my Excel over here, you see I have data analysis and solver. You should add both of those to, because we're going to be using data analysis for this week. And in week seven, uh, six and seven, we're going to be using solver. 
So make sure you add that. If you have trouble saying do it, Google and find a video, whether you're on a Mac or a PC, adding data analysis and or solver into whatever kind of Excel you have, Excel for PCs or Excel for Mac. So you go there, you go to the data tab, you go to data analysis. This dialog box clicks up and it has a full stat package. Go down to regression and click it. Okay, and when you do that, then you can start entering numbers. And I can show you how we would do this for this problem. So let me go back over here and let me copy my data. And I'll just create a new tab. And I didn't copy it, I just highlighted it. Copy. Go over here, highlight. And paste that, so I got my X and Y. So I go over to, um, and let me make this smaller so you can see it. I don't need this. And I'm in my data tab, so I go to data analysis, and I just scroll. Here's my regression right there. So I click on it, and now it's asking me for input a Y range. So where's my Y range? I'm going to highlight my Y like that, and notice I included the label. And then it wants the X. So I go to my X and I do that. So I could put something else in for the labels X and Y. But if I click that there's labels, it's going to take the first entry as label. And maybe I'll do a confidence interval of 95. And I want my output range to be on this slide. So let's put it right here as opposed to a, a different tab. And what does it do? do? It prints out the summary. Now notice it gives me the same R squared and uh, normally you don't need all these decimal places so if you want to fix it uh, you won't have any argument from me on that regard. Um, oh let's see. Four decimal places is more than enough. Four decimal places is more than enough. Probably more than, it's probably already too many. We're not flying rocket ships to the moon. That seems to be my mantra. But notice the R squared right there. 6.94. Here's my intercept and my x variable, and you can see that the intercept is 2 and it's 1.25. So 2 plus 1.25x is this. Um, here's the significance test on the f test. And notice that the significance test, when I only have one variable, that number, let me highlight that in a different color, orange, is the same as the p value on the t test for each individual variable. So the smaller this number, if this number is below 5%, that's what we're going to use in this class, that means this is a significant regression model. That means that the slope, 1.25, is significant. The intercept, don't worry about the p-value there. We're only worried about the variable coefficients. So one way of interpreting this, and we'll, we'll look at more of this when we get into the... Uh, uh, interpretation a little bit later what what some of those numbers mean so if you do that and you they get the same results we do so a high R squared close to one is desirable um, social scientists if they're looking at the relationship between uh, parents being an alcoholic and a kid being an alcoholic they're they're happy to uh, have 12 14 15 percent R squared because they're saying for 12, 14, 15 percent of the reason the kid is an alcoholic can be explained because the parent was an alcoholic. Now they want to go and find out what the other percentages are. So here's the sum of squares. First one is regression, residual, total. 
and residual is also error. And then they create an F test from that, and then they do an F as the significance of the F test. We're going to use 0.05. Anything less than 0.05 is significant. Here's the coefficients, as we said, and you can do a T test on each individual variable. There's only two, the F test significance and the T test uh, significance or p-value is the same. So what are the assumptions that we make in this? Errors are independent, errors are normally distributed, errors have a mean of zero, and they have a constant variance. So a plot of the residuals will often highlight any glaring violations of this assumptions. This is what you want your residuals, your errors to look like. So there's, for each x, what is the error? This is y hat minus y, or y minus y hat. So when it looks like this and it's well bounded, uh, it means that you're probably your model is valid. When the errors grow as x grows, you have a non-constant error variance and you probably shouldn't use the model. If it has a weird relationship, this might indicate the relationship is not linear. We're not going to be studying any of this. This is just for your information. We're not going to use any of this in a homework. Errors are assumed to have a constant variance, but we usually don't know what it is. We can measure it by taking the sum of squared errors, n minus k minus 1, where n is the number of observations in the sample, k is the number of independent variables. So if we just only have two variables, it's going to be n minus 2 sum of squared error divided by n minus 2. They call that degrees of freedom. I don't know why. Uh, so in this case, we get this, the variance is this. The standard deviation is the square root of that, or 1.31. We're not going to use that very much either. When the sample size is too small, you can get good values for MSE and R squared, even if there's no relationship. Well, think about it. If I only have two points, two points determine a line, it's going to be R squared of 100% and it's going to be a variance of zero because two points determines the line. So testing the model for significant helps. Two points is not enough to do a linear regression. You probably want a lot more than that. So testing the model for significance. We start with a general linear model. The null hypothesis, remember from that statistics, is that we assume the slope is zero, which means there's no relationship. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a linear relationship and beta one is not zero. If the null hypothesis can be rejected, we have proven there is a relationship. We use the F statistic for this. So we calculate the F statistic. It was in that output on the uh, uh, data analysis that we looked at. And here's how they calculate the F statistic. An F statistic has two degrees of freedom. One of them is K, the number of independent variables. So in the case of AAA, that's going to be one. And a second degree of freedom for the denominator is uh, six minus one minus one. There's six data points. So it's going to be four. If there's very little error, the MSE would be small and the F statistic would be large, indicating the model is useful. If the F statistic is large, the significance level, the p-value, will be low, indicating it's unlikely this would have occurred by chance. And this is best shown by a picture, which I believe is going to be in the next slide, or in the next few slides. So when the F-value is large, we can reject the null hypothesis and accept that there's a relationship. There's nothing magical about statistics. It's a very rule-based decision-making, actually. So here's a, the null hypothesis. The slope is zero. The, the alternative hypothesis slope is not zero. And we're going to use this test. Common values are, of, of significance are 0.01 and 0.05. I think we use 0.05 for all our homework here. Make a decision using one of the following methods. Reject the null hypothesis if the test statistic is greater than the F value. We're not going to use that. I like p-values. Reject the null hypothesis if the observed significance level, or p-value, is less than the level of significance alpha. 
otherwise do not eject. So if the p-value is greater than the p of the f statistic being greater than the calculated statistic, we reject if the p-value is less than alpha. Okay? So in this case, we calculate all this stuff. And we're never going to do that because it's going to calculate it for us. And we reject the null hypothesis because 9.09 .09 was greater than 1. That's the first way, using the F statistic. Now we use the p-value. And this 7.71 from here, which is the F threshold statistic based on the significance, and the p-value says where is where is our calculated point? So we're saying in this whole distribution, if we end up in here, in this 5% tail of this distribution, we're going to assume it's a rare event and it didn't occur. This, this distribution is not true. We're going to reject the null hypothesis before. We can conclude there is a statistically significant relationship between x and y. The R squared value of 0.69 means about 69% of the variability in the sales is explained by the local payroll. So this is, this is the analysis of variance table from the ANOVA analysis of variance table. This is a summary of that. And there's where the F statistic and the significance are. So you can watch this video, you can look at the slides, you can read the book. Uh, all of it will yield the same kind of thing. So the significance level or the p-value for this F statistic is 0.0394 or 3.94%. It's less than 5%, therefore we, we can reject it. The null hypothesis, which means there is a relationship. Multiple regression uses different variables, x1 through xk. Still has a constant, but each of these is linear. That's why we call it linear regression. But it's linear in these multipliers, in the coefficients, not necessarily in the variables. So in other words, x1 could be a specific variable. x2 could be x1 squared, and it would still work. So why is it a dependent variable, a response variable? x sub i is the ith independent variable, predictor explanatory variable. B, beta 0 is, again, the intercept. When all x values are 0, what's the value of y? And b sub i is the coefficient of the ith independent variable. The k is the number of independent variables. e is that random error again, that epsilon. So we're trying to predict the these betas, we're trying to estimate betas with sample statistics B1 through BK. And it's the same thing. Y is a predicted, Y hat is a predicted value. B sub 0 is the intercept. X1 through X and X2 are the two independent variables. B1 and B2 are the slopes for X1 and X2 independently. So Jenny Nelson wants to develop a model to determine the suggested listing price for houses based on size, age, and age of the house, okay? So the data is right here. And the condition is good, excellent, mint, whatever. So she's got the selling price of the house, square footage, age, and condition. Now, a realtor would want to know this, right? What would you want to predict here? Well, I want to predict the selling price, and I'd like to have these independent variables because when I pick a house, I can't control its square footage, its age, or its condition, but I could pump these numbers into some model and see what the selling price should be. And if this is some historical data of things that have sold recently, it's probably not a bad way to start. So I'm only looking at square footage and age. So notice that when I go to data analysis, I want A3 through A17 for my Ys. That's why they have the Ys first. A3 through A17. And then they go B3 to C17. So B3 is here, C17 is here. So they're using square footage and age. As, it's going to look at columns. And I've also specified that labels are there. So it's going to use these two columns to try to predict this. And it's going to have my output range is going to put it on the same chart uh, 
on, on the same worksheet, beginning at A19. So what happens? All right, we get an R squared of 67. So 67 percent, the 67.2 percent of the variation in the selling price is based on square footage and age. Um, I go here. Low significance for F. It's 0 0.002. So even at a 1% significance, this is a significant model. If I look at my p-values, I see that, and remember, we don't do the intercept, but it says my p-value for here is below 1%. My p-value for here is for 1%. So these are both significant. If one of these two were not, I would run the model again, eliminating the one that's not. So evaluation is similar to simple linear regression. We use the p-value for the f-test, and r squared are interpreted the same way. Again, we have this null hypothesis. The slope is 0. And h1, the slope is not 0. Uh, the test statistic is calculated if the p-value is lower than the significance level. The p-value for the f-test is 0.002. The r squared is... 0.6719, but the F-test is for the entire model, and we can't tell if one or both of the independent variables are significant. By calculating a p-value for each variable, we can access the significance of each independent variable. And this is a T-statistic. It's different than an F-statistic. And here's the p-values for those, as we talked about. So the next thing we do is we add a binary or dummy or indicator variable. Because if we go back, I'd like to find out if the house, uh, this mint, good, excellent mint condition, because, you know, you could have a house of 2,000 square feet, both uh, 40 years old. One could be in, in poor condition, and, you know, it could be a, uh, a renovator's dream, a fixer-upper, as they say, or, or it could be in mint condition, or it could be in excellent condition. So that pay makes a difference. But I can't use this variable right now because why? Well, the it's not numerical. And all these calculations are done numerically. This is alphabetic. It's a categorization. So what they do with this is they create something called a dummy variable or indicative variable. A dummy variable is assigned a value of 1 if a particular condition is met or zero otherwise. The number of dummy variables must equal one less than the number of categories. I cheat a little bit and only add one variable. So they have they add an X3. One if the house is in excellent condition, zero otherwise. X4, one if the house is in mint condition, zero otherwise. And then if they're both zero, the house is in good condition because that's the only other condition left. What I would normally do here is assign and I'm not sure it's actually the right way to do it, but I've done it before and it seems to be okay. I add uh, 0, 1, and 2, or I add 1, 2, and 3. 1 if it's good, one if it's mint, uh, 2 if it's excellent, 3 if it's mint, but uh, do it the way the book says. It's probably better. So now they've added these extra variables. And it represents, so 0, 0 is good, 1, 0 is excellent, 0, 1 is mint, is how you arrange that. And then you run you run it again, the same variables, except now instead of going from B2 to C17, I go all the way to E17. So I want to include my dummy variables. Again, labels in the front row, probably they didn't put confidence intervals, but it calculates it anyway. That's apparently the way they do it. And my output range is going to be the same place. And when I look at it, I see my p-values are all significant. And my r-squared has jumped up to 89.8%. So I'm probably happier with this model than I was with the first model. And the model, the, it's, it's even more significant. It's significant to uh, 0.1 of alpha of 0.1%. So it's pretty good. And all my p-values here are significant. Again, we don't worry about the intercept. And that's how this works. So model building. The best model is statistically significant model 
with a high R squared and a few variables. The more variables that are added to the model, R squared usually increases. It will because you're adding more data. Might not increase by a lot. For this reason, the adjusted R squared value is often used to determine youth usefulness of, the, of an additional variable. The adjusted R squared takes into account the number of independent variables in the model. So you could use R squared or adjusted R squared. So here's a formula for R squared. Adjusted R squared takes into account the degrees of significance. And it offsets it and it makes you be, just be a little bit more conservative when you look at it. In general, if new variables increase, the adjusted R squared, it should probably be included in the model. If some cases variables contain duplicate information, that happens. We say that two independent variables are collinear. Like, let's say you used x and 2x. Well, they're related. You don't need both of them. Take one out. Uh, it was not going to help you at all. When one more than two independent variables are Correlated multicollinearity exists. When it's present, hypothesis tests for individual coefficients are not valid, but the model may still be useful. And really, for ease of calculation, we try to take collinear variables out. Um, I'm on a roll, so we're going to cover a little bit of nonlinear regression. Um, it's not always a line. If I want to say, beta 0 plus beta 1 times x squared. That's a parabolic model in terms of x, but in terms of betas, it's linear. It's still a line because beta 0 and beta 1, there's no betas in the denominators of anything. There's no betas as exponents. The betas are linear. The multipliers are the raw data and those can be nonlinear, but it's linear in terms of this. So here's another one. Colonial Motors wants to use regression analysis to improve fuel efficiency. So they have uh, some data, and we have, this is similar to a problem that you're going to actually have in the homework. And you have miles per gallon, you have the weight of the data. So it looks like that. If you were to plot it, and if you were to do the regression, it's significant. And you see the p-values are here, and r squared is 75%. Not bad. But if we do a nonlinear model for MPG data, like um, they use two variables, perhaps, and they square the weight. x2 is the weight squared. So it looks like it should be B0 plus B1 X1 plus B2 X1 squared. It's still linear in the Bs is the point. And if you do this one and square that and do the model, it's 0.84, which I'm not sure added that much. Well, it went up from 7.4, or the adjusted R squared was 7.1, and it went up to... 84 or 81, so it did increase, and the p-values for all of these are significant, so you could keep them. And it might actually make sense if you have a subject matter expert. The heavier the car, the, the gas mileage is, is probably going to keep going down, but it seems to be plateauing. At a certain weight, that's just you're probably going to decrease at a lower rate. It's supposed to be a parabola, so it should start going up again, but that would have to be a pretty hefty car. I mean, you get, this is a five-ton car right here. So this is another example, is this model is only valid within the realm of the minimum x, the maximum x, the minimum actually observed y, and the maximum y. So in this box, this model is valid. As soon as I try to predict outside of here, and if it shows that the gas mileage goes up the heavier the car, we know, that's where you need a subject matter expert. No, that's not possible. You have to collect some more data for heavier cars and see that it's probably going to do something like, 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 like this. It's probably not going to, it's not quadratic in that region anymore. This model won't work. So be very careful about this. 
So there's the model. 79 is the intercept, 79.8. Minus 30.22 is the, uh, for each 1,000 pounds, the, uh, the gas mileage is going to drop 30.2. And for uh, each additional thousand pounds, when I square it, it's going to actually increase it a little bit. So it's a weird model, but it, it has a better R squared. And if I just use it in a range where uh, I have my observations, I'm probably okay. Cautions and pitfall. Using a regression model beyond the range of the axis question. Well, we already talked about that. Uh, T-test for the intercept may be ignored, as this point is often outside the range of the model. A linear relationship may not be the best relationship, even if the F-test returns an acceptable value. A nonlinear relationship can exist, even if the linear relationship does not. And even though there's a relationship of statistically significant, it may not have any practical value. Like ice cream did not cause, eating ice cream did not cause polio. There was a correlation means they both happened with increasing frequency in the summer months when it was warm. But it does not, there's no, there might be a correlation, but there, there's no physical causal relationship. I tell a story here, which I will do right now. Driving to work in the early 80s and listening to National Public Radio. Uh, Journal of American Medical Association said that people that eat oatmeal for breakfast have significantly lower cholesterol. The conclusion everybody jumped to was eating oatmeal reduces cholesterol. It's a very logical conclusion to, to jump to. Is it true? Well, people started eating oatmeal because they thought it was a magic bullet and it was a cholesterol craze in the country, try to reduce cholesterol because it was a relationship to heart disease, and it had no impact, or very little impact. Now you need a subject matter expert, like I talked about before. What's the subject matter expert in this case? A dietitian, a, a medical health professional. And if you start asking the right questions, before the study came out, if people were eating oatmeal on a regular basis for breakfast, what were they eating for lunch and dinner? Were they turning around and having um, a big, fatty, greasy hamburger and then a steak and uh, french fries for dinner and, you know, cheesy potatoes or whatever? No. If they were having, in those days, if they were having oatmeal for breakfast, they were probably having salad for lunch with tofu or something of that nature and a healthy, you know, lean piece of fish for dinner and uh, a little bit of wild rice and some uh, grilled vegetables. So it was the total diet of which oatmeal for breakfast was but an indicator. And it wasn't a magic bullet as much as the Cheerios and Quaker Oats people wished that it were. The other thing is you can get things the wrong way. You, uh, in the 60s, there was a study, 1960s, there was a study that showed there was a relationship between people that smoke and people that get lung cancer. There was a correlation. You can show a relationship. You can get a Pearson correlation coefficient for two variables. Now, how do you determine a causal level? Um, does cigarette smoking cause lung cancer? Or do people with a proclivity to get lung cancer want to smoke more? Well, we know the science behind it now because biochemists and medical people were involved and they found out and they did further study. They didn't just jump, jump to a conclusion from the correlation that the chemicals in cigarettes, the tars and nicotines and other chemicals, react with the tissues in the lungs and they metastasize into a lung cancer. So the relationship is cigarette smoking increases the risk of lung cancer and they then are able to quantify it. So you got to be careful how you examine. Correlation does not mean causality. And you need someone that knows what the heck they're doing, as Disney said, to make sure that you have that. I guess we covered the whole chapter, which is pretty good. There's a couple of videos for helping your homework. There's another video that shows how to do that simple linear regression 
using Excel. And then there's another one that shows how to use uh, data analysis to do regression. And I even show how there you can add, uh, if you have a Mac, how to add it. If you, if you have a PC, just Google it, adding data analysis and, sol and or solver to your Excel. And there's plenty of videos that will uh, help you do it. It's not that hard. Or, or call me if you, I guess you, you have issues. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the time. And we'll talk again soon via video.